We're set for our final session uh, this afternoon. Um, and to lead us off, we have Robert Kreider. Robert is a teacher, historian, churchman, and author. He was born in Illinois, grew up in Indiana, Ohio, and Kansas, and graduated from Bethel, Kansas College. He earned a master's in social ethics from the University of Chicago Divinity School and a PhD in European history from the University of Chicago. Robert served as a conscientious objector during World War II, stationed for a time in Colorado Springs. He's an emeritus professor of history from Bluffton, Ohio College, where he was academic dean and president. He is also emeritus professor from Bethel College, where he taught peace studies and directed the Mennonite Library and Archives. He continues to write, travel, and consult. Welcome. <clears throat> I am here to describe a national experiment unlikely to be repeated. On June 5, 1941, a camp for conscience objectors to war, that is COs, operated at Templeton Gap on the northwest edge of Colorado Springs. Then the U.S. not at war. Colorado Springs was a peaceful town of 37,000 no Camp Carson, no U.S. Air Force Academy, no NORAD. Ours was the first civilian public service, that is CPS, camp for COs west of the Mississippi. The camp occupied 10 Army-style barracks that had been evacuated by the Civilian Conservation Corps. On arid land within the shadow of Austin Bluffs, the site commanded a majestic view of Pikes Peak. On the morning of August 15, 1941, 25 of us arrived by train from Kansas. Meeting us at the station was the camp director, Albert Geddard, a 30-year-old Mennonite pastor, fresh from seminary. The CPS program for ZOs was administered by three layers. One, on top, selective service under General Louis B. Hershey. Two, coordinating the engaged religious groups was the National Service Board for Religious Objectors, NSBRO. Third, a divide, dividing the task of administering 151 camps and units were the three historic peace churches, Brethren, Quakers, Mennonite. A total of 12,000 drafted COs served nationwide. This compared to the 12 million drafted into the military. In addition, nearly 6,000 were imprisoned in 24 federal penitentiaries and correctional in institutions for refusing any form of military service. The men in CPS received no pay, church agencies paid program costs. Back in 1917, the U.S. entered the war making no provision for pacifist dissenters. CEOs were simply segregated off in detention camps, a few threatened with lynching, some imprisoned, two Hutterite COs dying at Leavenworth, their bodies shipped home in army uniforms. Only late in the war were farm furloughs arranged. That was 1917. As a Mennonite, I knew from childhood that in the event of war, I would not fight. Close friends of our family had served as pacifists, COs, after World War I, as relief workers in France and Russia. A family friend was imprisoned as a pacifist in Leavenworth. Influential was a ministerial student, often in our home who had served in the Army in 1918, 
When released, he became an ardent pacifist. Confronted by Nazi aggression, I confess I did feel my Mennonite pacifism challenged. After serious thoughts, I registered as a conscientious objector. Having just finished a master's degree, I arrived eager for a break from studies. In, in 12 months, I could return to doctoral studies. We did not know of a Pearl Harbor to follow in December, and with it, four years of total war. For me, four years, three months, and 27 days of conscription. Arriving in camp with a university degree, could I cut it in this unique gang of men? I wanted to be just Bob, not an academic. For 40 hours a week, we worked transported by truck to farms in the Fountain River Valley for pick and shovel work, digging dams and diversion ditches, building fences for the Soil Conservation Service. It was menial work for men accustomed to using tractors on the farm. A few men printed, uh, planted trees and cleared trails in the Pike National Forest. Our most unusual project, an eight-man crew that shingled the roof of the Pikes Peak Summit House. We call it the most lofty CPS project <laughs> in the nation. Less than a month in camp, I was confronted by a decision that threatened my hope of blending in as a regular guy. I was startled to be asked to be assistant camp director. I stalled in answering. A visiting church executive I respected counseled that he had long adhered to the rule. When the church asks you to serve, let your answer be yes, unless there is a good reason to say no. <laughs> a fellow camper was appointed business manager. Both of us, 22-year-olds, we accepted the first CBS conscripts to be administrators. In a camp of 100, soon growing to 160, 43 of the draftees had only finished eighth grade. 26 completed high school, 12 some college, 11 college degrees, three with master's degrees. I reported 92 Mennonites from eight different groups, plus 18 from other denominations, Methodist, Evangelical and Reformed, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Plymouth Brethren, Jehovah's Witness, Hepzibah Faith Mission, Crusaders for Christ, Baptized Holiness, Nazarene, Apostolic. We came from 12 states, 90% from farm or small town. Arriving in camp, I was intrigued by the diversity among fellow campers, only a handful now living. No one to correct my misrepresentation. <laughs> we felt a bonding, a camaraderie, mostly strangers. We were thrust into this together. The first Jehovah's Witness I ever met was a big, silent, conscientious worker. Three Palmer brothers were furloughed as CEOs from a federal penitentiary in Wyoming. And Paul, a fresh recipient of a master's degree in physics, started a camp shortwave radio station with a couple hours of programming each day, broadcast over a 50-mile radius, short-lived, halted after the U.S. entered the war. We had our oddballs, each treated with deference, 
perhaps amusement and affection, whispering Pete with his loud foghorn voice. <laughs> Boomersheim, a miner from Wyoming, our stoic night watchman. Glanzer from South Dakota, camp buffoon, who took a lot of razzing and seemed to enjoy it. In addition, three Hutterites from a colony in South Dakota, four old order Amish in plain dress, a dozen men dropped out of CBFs for the military. Their reasons differed, influence of a girlfriend, indifferent pacifist commitment, home pressures. Along with those who gave camp variety were lots of steady brothers, Dower Ray, camp business manager, later becoming a well-to-do industrialist. My bank mate, Roland, office manager, who married a Colorado Springs girl and later became a professor of English at the University of Oregon. Jesse, from the panhandle of Oklahoma, camp physician, a college teacher after the war, also serving 10 years as a Democrat on the campus in, in, in the Kansas House of Representatives. Mel, son of a missionary parents in China, in the post-war, a psychiatric social worker. Camp director Albert set a tone for the camp as a friend of each camper, a top athlete in, his, in any competition. Each morning after breakfast, we, he led a brief devotion that invited us to model a community of peace. Albert led in prayer before each meal, sometimes calling on a camper. Apprehensive at first as to our reception in Colorado Springs, we were pleased to be received hospitably. On Sunday mornings, campers piled in to pick up trucks to attend services in local churches. A United Brethren was the most popular congregation. It was a time to escape male society into a normal world of all ages, including especially women. <laughs> Many found girlfriends, several leading to marriage, and route on the train coming to camp, four men formed a quartet, Hobe, Stumpy, Les, and Ike. Soon the quartet was in wide demand in churches of the area. On the Sunday night of Pearl Harbor, a group of us were guests of a mainline Colorado Springs congregation. Roland and I speakers that evening to an audience of 200. We treaded ever so carefully, anxiously aware that on the next day, our nation would be at war. One of the first CPS camps, we drew wide interest from home communities in Kansas and beyond. Distinguished visitors came to observe this experiment in pacifist community living. Favorable articles appeared in the Colorado Press, our camp paper, the Pikes Peak Peace News, quickly acquired 800 subscribers. Central for me was the educational program I, which I coordinated. We launched a variety of classes for our, e our evenings. Attendance was voluntary. Accounting, welding, livestock management, woodworking, first aid, music appreciation, and much more. The centerpiece was the core course, which integrated peacemaking with the several faith traditions of campers, an attempt at ecumenical education, including biblical study, ethics of peace and war, Tolstoy, Gandhi, Francis of Assisi. From Colorado Springs and our colleges, 
We tapped a dozen resource persons. Their services offered pro bono, some coming for a week, a few joining on work projects. The soil conservation staff, accustomed to managing a CCC camp of teenage boys, had problems coping with a diverse assortment of COs, most with farm skills and competent with power equipment, a third with some college, men impatient with petty routines. Soil conservation, conservation and forestry staffs were indifferent to environmental instruction. In July 1942, Camp Director Gettert was absent on a CPS assignment, leaving me in charge of the camp. One day, the men returned from war, from work, distressed that they had been shifted into publicized war work in sugar beet fields. I carried to the soil conservation staff the men's protest of being pressed into war work. The staff erupted by giving me a tongue lashing. They were highly indignant being confronted by a 23-year-old draftee. Gratefully, I was backed by the National Service Board. The soil conservation staff did retreat. It was the low point in my CPS career. An official was remembered who hated COs, but when he was to be transferred, campers staged a farewell dinner in his honor. Campers spoke of him appreciatively. Overcome with tears, he broke down, couldn't speak. Meanwhile, we staged celebrative events with good food and program, and this boasted morale. In June, a graduation program was staged for those who had served a year. It included a processional with audience rising, class song by the camp chorus, class prophecy, class will, band music, and address by Joe, our camp comedian, the awarding of diplomas. Later in June, a farewell banquet for Camp Director Albert and family. On the tables were napkins and flowers. The program consisted of a burlesque, dramatic review of Albert's life in seven acts. Each act interspersed with special music. This gaiety came a week after the unpleasant encounters with the soil conservation and selective services. The camp bounced back. Reading daily the war news, we were restless to engage in work with risk, sacrifice, challenge. In 1942, opportunities began to open, calling for a wider range of skills, public health, and hookworm control in Florida, ward attendance in a mental hospital in Denver, operating bulldozers and building a dam in Montana, hospital and community service in Puerto Rico, guinea pig projects in starvation experiments, dairy testing, training for overseas relief, and more. Notably challenging was work in mental hospitals, depleted of staff. 1,400 men in the 22 units administered by Mennonites. All of this was welcomed as it operated under wider options and challenges. In September 1943, I was in Durban, South Africa with a team of eight en route to open relief work in West China. Regularly, regrettably, the program was canceled 
by a writer to an appropriation bill of Congress we ordered home. Following six years of civilian public service, General Lewis B. Hershey concluded, CPS was an experiment to find whether our democracy is big enough to preserve minority rights in a national emergency. CPS probably was an experiment that never would be repeated. Wars there would be, but never universal conscription. At Templeton Gap, a collection of COs from varied backgrounds formed an instant community with its flaws. CPS was our college without tuition, grades, credits or degrees. Dissenters, we were on a road less traveled. No map, no instructors, all learners. A wartime experiment. Our second speaker this afternoon is Bill Sulzman. He's a peace activist who first came to Colorado Springs as an army draftee in the early 1960s. Born on a farm in western Kansas in the last years of the Dust Bowl, he has traveled extensively, becoming a world citizen by choice, as he's described himself here, as a result of an important stay in Uganda in 1968. He earned a BA in history from St. Benedict's College, Atchison, Kansas, a BA in philosophy from St. Thomas Seminary in Denver, and an STL, uh, equivalent to a master's degree in Catholic theology from Gregorian University in Rome. Ordained to the Catholic priesthood in 1968, he spent seven years in the priesthood in Colorado Springs in Denver. After returning to Colorado Springs in the early 1970s, he became a military dissenter. Along with experiences as a taxi and school bus driver, Bill has 22 years of experience in soup kitchen work and since 1987 has been director of Citizens for Peace in Space, a local peace group focusing on military space issues, which has resulted in numerous arrests for civil disobedience. Bill. So I've, <clears throat> I've been outed there as, as not necessarily being an objective observer, uh, not that anyone really is. But the, the subject that I'm going to be covering here, I, I believe the facts speak for themselves. Um, just some background, it was already mentioned, I was, I was in the Army at Fort Carson as a draftee, 61 to 63, that's the, that's the fort we're going to be talking about. And I got out in uh, September of 63, there were 13,000 troops in Vietnam. It was the era of Cold War mythology. That was the reason the domino theory was in play, and that was what was driving the war. My experience in the Army led me to believe by the time I left that I would not take part in that war or any war. One of the crowning uh, experiences I had was walking around the motor pool at Fort Carson with a weapon during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I look back on that as the, uh, the most absurd thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> and that it was, it was tied into an ideology driving people into things that were really not rational. Anyway, uh, so I was, even when, as I left there, I was not prepared to start to learn what five years later was happening at Fort Carson. There were, of course, five years of intervening war, build-up escalation, uh, news of, of uh, atrocities. And as I knew then, to some degree, and as I found out a lot more about, there was dissent in the ranks on an unprecedented level. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the reasons this topic for me is very germane now, that 
reality is more and more scrubbed out of accounts of the Vietnam War. But as you look into it, that's what stopped the ground war and it ultimately uh, led to the stopping of the, both the air and the uh, naval operations as well in, in sequence. <clears throat> so we're down to 68 to 72. 68 things were really building at Fort Carson. And uh, this book was very influential along with a couple of others in getting me prepared for this. It was written by uh, David Courtright, and he documents what was going on at Fort Carson, as well as about a dozen other bases, including bases in Vietnam. It was all of a piece. There was uh, the most significant resistance was happening in the Marine Corps and the Army in Vietnam. But as people came back to civilian bases, it was happening here, and they became a very important part of the peace movement. And the uh, photo on the cover is, I think, you know, very uh, instructive as to the anguish of the soldier there predicted. And um, I have a kind of a timeline thing here that documents some of the concentrated acts of resistance at Fort Carson. And as I say, they were mirrored around at various other bases. And we'll go through them, but then we'll come back to some of them in a little more detail. <clears throat> the first big thing I have there is the Fort Carson stockade uprising. Uh, five guards were taken hostage. And in order to restore order, 30 people were injured. It was hard to get any detail on that, and with this, as, as with a lot of other stuff, if there are people in the room who can help me be better informed, I would like that, because I, you know, I, this is sort of a work in progress. But it um, doesn't say how badly the, anybody was hurt, but it took a long time to restore order. The next thing on that list is the uh, GIs taking part in an anti-Nixon GI civilian demonstration. And this was another part of what was going on at Fort Carson being part and parcel of the peace movement in Colorado Springs. Contrary to this notion that the peace movement was at war with the GIs, the opposite was true. They often worked in concert, such as in this first uh, demonstration noted here. In the same month, the first home front coffee house opens. It was a GI coffee house off base to get the cover of a civilian environment. It was on East Pikes Peak Avenue. The building is still there. We'll see a picture of it a little later. And uh, again, pointing out the joint nature of the peace movement, civilian and military, some of the key staff were had been recent graduates of Colorado College. And uh, the uh, location was used as the kind of the foundation of the above ground, underground press paper that was published by GIs of Fort Carson <clears throat> and distributed there. And there's one note in the literature that says one of the things that uh, GIs of Carson did is fly the uh, above ground paper over the fence of the stockade uh, so that people inside could read it. And now we have the first act of descent noted in the, in the literature. Uh, a Spec 5 Kurt Stocker, one of the uh, editors of the paper above ground, filed charges under the Universal Code of Military Justice against his CO and a an, uh, military intelligence officer at Fort Carson uh, for violating his First Amendment rights. And much of the publishing, if you read that paper, is based on soldiers have rights, and it's not okay for them to be denied the right to <clears throat> free speech or to not follow orders if they think they're wrong. Uh, the next thing is a GI Rights Day at Fort Carson. And then another highlighted event is 
Charles Swanson being transferred and placed under surveillance for trying to get an American serviceman union's uh, presence at the base. And then another th uh, thing is, is, a, is a PFC, William Reynolds, who was punished for doing an interview with the Washington Post. Um, then some more of the publication above ground started putting names in the paper and outing people that they felt were harassing them. Then another, a second underground paper began to be published at Fort Carson. It was called Counterattack. I have not been able to find any issues of that, if anybody in the room happens to know how or they have one, it would be appreciated. Then, um, 1970, GIs, again, with this cooperative thing, uh, military and civilian peace movement, sponsored uh, what was pretty common then called a Festival of Life, kind of like a pro-life rather than just an anti-war demonstration. Um, and in that, the march that took place as part of that was a march on Ant Air Force Base. We heard reference to that. It was in town. It's now the Olympic Training Center. And the most visible location, 500 people marched there, among them a lot of GIs. Um, then there's a few more things here, uh, and we'll get to some of these in a little more detail. Other demonstrations, again, jointly sponsored by civilian and military working very closely together in the 1970s. Then we get to the, a major pushback that happened at Fort Carson where it became the subject of a cover story in, in Life magazine. Um, you know, they had that serious riot here. <clears throat> in general, there were 26,000 troops at Fort Carson, as many as there are now. And many of them had come back from the war. The stockade was bulging with people. And we'll go into some detail about who was in, in the stockade there that led to that riot. Anyway, the pushback was they brought the commandant of the uh, West Point out here to run the base. And he set it up to be a model place mirroring what was going to be the voluntary army, Volar. And he loosened things up, canceled KP, canceled uh, GI parties, if you know what that means, and uh, loosened dress codes. And with an attempt to win back the loyalty of the troops, because they were, in fact, in revolt. And the Army didn't quite know what to do with it. They were cutting back on the numbers in Vietnam and so forth, but they weren't doing it fast enough. <clears throat> so let's see if we have some time to go into some things in detail here. Now, one thing that led to why there were so many uh, people there was something that was happening <clears throat> called fragging. And there's a quote from here from uh, kind of an official army historian that talked about the breakdown of the <clears throat> war in Vietnam. And you know, in fact, his book is called The Rise and Fall of an American Army. And uh, one of the biggest evidences that was the number of what were called fragging cases where soldiers were c killing or maiming or attempting to kill or maim other soldiers who they thought were too gung-ho. But they often got tried, and there, there's a personal connection to that locally, where a, a very prominent retired attorney and judge in this town was at that time an Army defense attorney in Vietnam. He told me he had defended 300 cases in all of various kinds of insubordination. Six of them were fragging cases. He got five of them off. Nobody would testify against them. And uh, so obviously a lot of those people came back here, <clears throat> became, you know, continued to be resistant to the war. The other thing up there is the the number of 47 percent 
by a survey contemporaneous said that people in the army were engaging in some kind of dissent. You could imagine what the effect of that was and why so many people were in trouble with the law, uh, including this statistic. The percentage of people either just going AWOL or going beyond the uh, time limit and being considered deserters. Again, that gives you some idea about why that jail would have been full out there. And this is a little bit more detailed on that prison riot. Hard to find details, but finally the Colorado Springs Free Press, which is the predecessor of the Colorado Springs Sun, was able to dig into a story that got some of the basic details of how big a deal that was. Uh, they lost control of the stockade, and a lot of people got hurt getting it back in control. But um, the Fort Carson paper did not cover this. I couldn't find any place else other than the Sun, and they had a hard time. The TV had obviously covered it, and they were piggybacking on that, trying to dig into the story. We mentioned the uh, Homefront Coffee House. This is a picture of it then, and I think there's a picture of it now, so it's still there. Uh, this is the story itself that appeared in the Gazette Telegraph. They did run a story on the coffee house, big story, and they talked about what went on there and how it was a center of GI dissent in the city and that the newspaper kind of used it, their, their underground paper used it kind of as their headquarters too. And uh, most of the servicemen who visit the coffee house are from Fort Carson, although it is said that men from Ant Air Force Base occasionally drop by. They felt safe there, and so, um, again, that was their contact to the uh, civilian peace movement. This is another location of another drop-in center that uh, existed at that time where people got um, counseling and so forth. A couple of quotes from above ground, kind of focusing on telling people what their rights were. And if they felt they needed to dissent, that they had some right to do that. And this is an example of the kind of punitive action taken against some of the resistors. This guy was sent to Denver. And this is another example of the uh, close cooperation uh, where they joined in with a major peace demonstration in the city where 500 people walked to Ant Air Force Base, a lot of them GIs. The same day that this happened, five Colorado College students were arrested at the local draft board. There was a real concert uh, between civilian and military. And uh, this is part of where we switch over to the pushback, where the Army tried to get more liberal and win back the troops. This, this article appeared in the Mountaineer, in the Fort Carson paper. One of Jane Fonda's visits here, she got along great with General Rogers, visited the stockade, and they did this uh, little story with her. And this was her quote, it's in the Mountaineer, where she said why she was here and uh, gave a real boost to the, the uh, GIs and to the civilian community. And this is that cover story. This is in the Mountaineer again. They ran a cover, black and white photo of the cover of Life magazine, and here's that cover. They had a huge story where they kind of highlighted the loosened regulations. Um, and they have a, you know, a storyline to match that. And one of the things that the general did is uh, set up an official hot seat policy, where by now there was a coffee house on base. If you can't lick them, join them. So 
if they're all running to town to, to get involved in this stuff, let's do it out here. And uh, in this case, I'm not sure who the office, it might even be Rogers himself, but they would assemble a, a high-ranking officer who would get peppered with questions from the GIs, showing that we are, you know, we recognize you have First Amendment rights, and uh, we're not afraid of that. Uh, and this is the, the other person who got heavily involved along with Jane Fonda was the cartoonist from the Chicago Tribune, uh, Bill Malden. He visited here and he ordered a complete set of the Encyclopedia Britannica for the, the base. Another aside here is that a person very prominent in our community still was Roger's chief of staff, David Hughes, who uh, many of you will recognize from his uh, frequent letters to the editor. But he was totally into this. You know, I've, I talked to him for a couple of hours. He was totally into what they did then, and it was the right thing to do, and he really liked Jane Fonda and all, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, we are politically a little bit different from each other. And here are the other, the other side of that thing, along with the dissent, was really making it, um, loosening up the social media out there, bringing in go-go dancers and, and uh, trying to get things uh, free and easy so the soldiers would want to stay home and hopefully go back to war, although by this time, there wasn't much army and the dissent in the, within the ranks switched to the Navy and the Air Force as it became predominantly an air war. And that included some graduates of the Air Force Academy refusing to fly B-52 missions. That's in the Courtright's book. That um, as the air war became the uh, plosive action, then military dissenters, in the Navy especially, because they were doing a lot of the bombing, and so they began to stand up, refuse orders, et cetera, and finally brought the total end to the Vietnam War. Thanks. <laughs>